I'm Mark Boris, and this is Straight Talk. The three C's, control what you can control, concentrate on what counts, cope with what you can't control. I think we would all live a better life. Pedro Skulian, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thank you, Mark, appreciate it. Just take me back. What's your story? The Soviet Union had occupied Armenia, so my dad did whatever he needed to do to bribe the communist government for us to go on vacation to Italy. We went to the American consulate and landed in Los Angeles, California as political refugees. At that time, we don't speak the language, we don't understand the culture, we have $210 in our pocket. But with that said, coming to the United States so young, I believe it gave me an advantage to build myself into an entrepreneur with multiple companies, and today I get to serve humanity because of that. At 21, this gentleman, Jim Franco, he was a mentor to me. He taught me how to become an entrepreneur, how to create value in exchange for money, how to solve problems. The more complex the problems that you solve, the more money you can make. We are wired to serve. If you don't have a sense of purpose, routine, the need to serve, we will start self-destructing and digging holes in our life. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, food, social media. How do you find out what your purpose is? Good question. Well, I'll have two purposes. I'll start there. Your first purpose is... Pedro Skulian, welcome to Australia Talk, mate. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Actually, welcome to Australia. It is a pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful place. What are you guys doing? Are you doing a tour or something? What's happening? Yes, yeah. So we're on a tour. The tour is called Rise to Greatness, Fizz Productions. And uh, so tomorrow we'll be in Melbourne uh, speaking there, Rise to Greatness, um, Brisbane the next day, and then on Saturday back to here, Sydney, to finish off with the sold out crowd. Uh, again, Rise to Greatness is going to be a wonderful event. You've spoken at one like yeah. that before. It's sold out? Yes, awesome. yeah. The, the Sydney event is already sold out, yeah. Wow, that's cool. <clears throat> and by the way, you, you got to, what you got to do tonight, um, you got to watch the New South Wales versus Queensland. We got the, the, the talking about rise to greatness. I mean, this is the greatest clash of um, uh, I don't know, unadorned uh, warriors that anyone's ever going to see. So I'm just giving you a quick tip. Get on nine now, okay. the app, and watch that tonight, mate, because you're going to love it. And tell me who I'm rooting for. You've got to go for New South Wales. New South Wales. Please. Done. So I want to, cool in now, so when I hear um, names with uh, IAN on the end of it, okay. I immediately think of Armenians. Yeah. Are you Armenian? I am Armenian. And our cultures are very similar, Yeah, right? the what Greek culture and the Armenian mm-hmm. cultures are very similar. And in fact, but you and you guys love a barbecue too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You love a barbecue. Yeah. And, um, and so we Greeks, we love a, a barbecue as well. We don't call it barbecue, but we do love a barbecue. And, but just take me back though, because you're obviously American, um, or, as in USA, um, take me a little bit back. Uh, how did you become an American and what's your story? Yeah, so I'm actually transplant into the United States. Uh, my father was a, he became a member of the Communist Party in 1974, the year I was born, some 49 where, years old. Whereabouts, in the USA? In Armenia. In Armenia. In Armenia, Soviet Union. As part Union. of the Soviet. As part of the Soviet Union, yeah. Right. As you know, the Soviet Union had occupied Armenia. Yep. And in 1974, my father became a member of the Communist Party. Now. With that said, my father loves American music, loves American culture. So he was like an American who was born in a communist country. Um, And so my brother, who's older than me by 16 years. Wow. uh, Sorry, by 14 years, he was about to go into the Soviet army. And if you remember- As conscription though, like as part of conscript, like force. Yes, Yeah. exactly. And back then the Soviet army was fighting Afghanistan. And of course, those young men were coming back with limbs missing. And my dad said, there's no way that we've been occupied by the Soviet Union that my son is going to go fight in their, their, their war and come back with the limb missing. And so my dad did whatever he needed to do to bribe the communist government and for us to escape into Rome. We spent 10 days in Rome. We went to the American consulate and, um, on day 11, July 6, June 16, 1980, we landed in LAX, Los Angeles, California, as political refugees. Wow. Yeah. So uh, literally a former communist now in the United States. We, At that time, we don't speak the language. We don't understand the culture. We have $210 in our pocket, a family of five. I'm the baby of the family, six years old. So three, three kids <clears throat> and mom yeah, and dad. Yeah, correct. Three kids and mom and dad. And I'm the oops baby. So in other words, my brother's 14 years older. My sister's 16 years older. And I was born by accident. But of course, my thank parents. God. Thank God. Yeah, my <laughs> parents say that I was, I'm was. i their biggest blessing. And um, so so with that said, 
coming to the United States so young, I had the good fortune to assimilate easier. I assimilated, yeah. I was able to live the American dream. Um, we certainly lived in Section 8 housing, which is gov government-assisted housing, um, which is low-income housing. Whereabouts uh, in the U.S.? <clears throat> in Santa Ana, California, which is Southern California, um, Orange County. Santa Ana is the armpit of Orange County. It's the only way I could describe it. It's, 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 even now, it's not the greatest place. In 1980, a gang-infested, horrible community. But we were blessed and grateful to be in the United States. And so the government helped us out the best they could. My mom and dad, older brother, older sister, worked as much as they could and got us out of there and moved us into Anaheim, California. Cleaner, better place. Um, and today I live about 30 miles away from where my dad lives. My mom passed away last year uh, from dementia. But uh, I live in Chino Hills, California. It's just outside of Orange County. Beautiful place to be. And it actually reminds me, Southern California reminds me so much of Sydney in terms of the climate, the Very weather, similar. the water. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> do you ever think to yourself about the bravery of or the courage and maybe the commitment that your dad had to your family to make that call to just to get up and go? Mark, when I think about it, and, and I always tell my, my son and daughter, so my daughter is 16, my son is 18, Andrew and Chloe. And I tell them, it's not even the equivalent of like if we went to Japan, from the United States to Japan, because today you have Google Translate. Yeah. So you could speak English and it'll translate in Japanese. I said it, it would be the equivalent of escaping and going to Mars, where you're meeting Martians, you're learning a new culture, a new language. There is no Google Translate. They may want to kill you when you get there. Uh, in fact, let's say the United States would not be happy if we left. Like when I think about the severity of punishment that my dad could have faced. If for, got caught. If he got caught, holy smokes. Like the man risked his life. He risked our life to put us, his kids, in a better position. Is it, what, what does that mean though? Like, uh, I mean, you <clears throat> might, may not remember because you're six, but perhaps you do. Or perhaps I t your mum and dad sort of relate stories to you or your dad's, well, your mum and dad probably relate the stories to you. Definitely your older brother and sister would know. Did you have to sort of be secreted out of the joint, like uh, like go in the, uh, the you know the darker night, or yeah. did, uh, did you have to sort of hide in a train or pretend to be just going on a holiday? What what's the deal? So so here's here's a great story for you. Um, probably about six months before we we fled. Now I should tell you to preface the story. My dad was in, in a communist country. Everybody works for the government, right? And my dad worked for a clothing manufacturing plant, so he made suits. And he would put patterns, like a vest, pants, slacks, jacket, on material, and they'd cut it out and make suits. My dad got so clever, he would put the patterns so tight together that after making 10 or 11 suits, he had enough material, and he would smuggle that and go home, and he would make a pair of pants or a vest or a jacket for someone to buy on the black market. This is how he raised 25,000 rubles to be able to bribe the, the, the Soviet government to allow us to go on vacation on a holiday to Italy. So th this is like a side hustle. So, absolute side hustle. Like the old school <clears throat> side hustle. Man, Mark, in fact, one night, I remember it was dark. There was a knock on our door. Two KGB agents standing at the door. They tell my dad they have to inspect the house or the flat, the apartment that we lived in. And we were doing well for ourselves. Because once you're uh, a Communist Party member, you do well for yourself but they had gotten word that my dad might be planning an escape. So they said, we have to check your house, inspect your house. And it's not like the United States or here where there has to be a warrant and any of that stuff. They knock, they come in. I remember they lined us all up against the hallway wall. We're standing with our backs against the wall. They check for everything. They look for a thimble, chalk, a meter stick, anything that would signify that my dad is running a side hustle. My dad was so good at hiding everything, they found nothing. And my dad is fluent in five languages, one of them being Russian. And these were Russian KGB agents. So my dad said, look, let's not make this a wasted trip for you. I've got this bottle of vodka. Let's have a seat at the kitchen table and drink and talk. All night they drank. He got them drunk, made them happy, and sent them on their way. Six months later, we were on our holiday to Italy. And, and that we, was our escape. And what, 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 just I mean, pardon my ignorance, but I don't know much about Soviet Union time, that time. Was it okay 
to go on holiday. So was that a thing? You could say, look, we're going to go yes. on holiday, but we're going to come back. I mean, how did it all work? You now, have to make an application? Yeah, it's, it's okay to go on a holiday to a approved country. And of course, Italy, at the time being communist sympathizers, yeah. that was on the approved list. Right. And the story we had to make up, as the story goes like this, that my mom has a sister in Rome, Italy, which she did not. Oh, you had to make the story up? Oh, we had to make up a story. And we had to look like we're traveling with two suitcases. We had to make it look like we're going on a holiday. So we left everything behind to, to family, to cousins, to aunts and uncles. Now, if we said we're going on a holiday to the United States, forget it, it's over. Like, obviously the Cold War was happening. There's no way you're going to the, you're not going on a holiday to the United States. So we went to Italy knowing that they would approve us to go to Italy for 10 days. And like I said, we ended up spending all 10 days uh, in the, there were, there were hotels there that would take in political refugees like us that were privately owned. In fact, here's a beautiful thing about social media. Two years ago, I met a lady from Rome, Italy. She said, I think you and your family stayed in one of the hotels that my grandparents ran. Wow. And I asked my dad about it, and sure enough, he confirmed it, which was, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. And so, the, you know, there's a the beauty of social media there, right? And so as soon as we got there, we stayed at one of those hotels because, you know, we were broke. We were trying to make the best of our money. And in fact, I remember day two in Rome, Italy, I had my first banana. My dad bought a banana. He'd never tasted a banana. I'd never tasted a banana. Serious? Yeah. And I remember my dad bought five bananas, one for every member of the family. And after eating mine and realizing how good it was, I grabbed my dad's out of his hand and I ate his. And of course, being a good father, he let me have it. Uh, but my dad and my brother spent <clears throat> eight of the 10 days in the American consult pleading with them that, look, we are political refugees. I'm a Communist Party member. We escape. We're escaping. If we go back to the Soviet Union... They're sending him to Siberia, and it's a sure death. And so they pumped my dad for information for eight, nine days. And then they said, where do you want to go in, in California or in the United States? My dad only knew one person, a friend of a friend in California, and that friend had agreed to let us stay in his flat for one month. And so that's how we ended up in Southern California. And the gentleman was kind to us. He had a, a two-bedroom apartment, a flat. He and his wife were in one bedroom and the five of us were in another bedroom. But he said, you have 30 days. He helped my dad find a job, multiple jobs, paper route, pumping gas, helped my sister and my brother find a job. And within 30 days, we had enough money. And thanks to the government assisting, we ended up moving into Section 8 housing complex, which is that government assisted housing. And from there, it was just hard work and consistency, hard work and consistency. And my dad knew, um, so just about an hour north of Orange County, Santa Ana, where we lived, there's a city called Glendale. Glendale is predominantly Armenian. In right. fact, there are signs on the highway that say, Little Armenia. My dad said, we're not moving there. My mom would beg and plead, let's move to Glendale where we speak the language. We, we can get around easier. My dad said, no, we're gonna stay here where we have to assimilate, learn the language, understand the culture. And I think it was one of the greatest decisions he made um, and it was harder in, in, in defense of my brother and sister. It was very difficult for them. They were 19 and 21 years old. I was six years old. So I was able to assimilate to the American culture so much better than, than my siblings. But because of that, I believe it gave me an advantage to become the American dream and to build myself into an entrepreneur with multiple companies. And today I get to serve humanity because of that. You know, it's funny, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the product of a... Um, a refugee family and that uh, my father fled Greece when uh, the civil war was on between the communists in Greece and the nationalists in Greece. Mm -hmm. It was a civil war straight after World War Two, And, um, you know, we get these great opportunities when we, you know, by virtue of our parents making um, these great sacrifices for us. But the opportunities aren't enough. And I was only just talking to someone earlier on, it doesn't matter what your parents tell you. Um, for me, it's what I see my parents do, they're the things that actually um, sort of form my DNA and, and a lot of other people I know who, who are um, migrants here in Australia or the kids of migrants, first generations of Australians. What are the things that you saw in your dad and mum and probably your brother and sister given the, the age difference that you think formed characteristics for you that made you successful or ha helped make you successful? Um. 
I saw several things on, on the positive side. I saw work ethic that I, that I would not learn anywhere else other than from my mom and dad, brother and sister. I mean, they worked multiple jobs. My dad worked at a pizzeria, busing tables, a gas station pumping gas, and at two in the morning, he was delivering newspapers. Uh, my brother Mo worked two jobs and was going to um, junior college, university to learn English. My sister worked two jobs, going to junior college to learn English. My mom worked one job and was looking after me. I learned how to manage money. I learned how to live frugally. I learned that nothing can trump work ethic. Like my mom and dad and family had work ethic beyond everything. I also learned that, and this is a negative thing about being a, an immigrant to a country. And my dad in Armenian would say a, a, a phrase. He said, we would run out of money before we run out of month. And he was frustrated because he would have to make decisions. Do we keep the, the gas on or the electricity on or the water on, but we can't keep everything on. We would run out of money before we run out of month. So while I learned work ethic and how to be frugal and manage money, I also learned to fear money because in my head, money was always scarce. It was something that other people could come by that we couldn't. And so when we came by it, we have to hoard it. We have to be careful with it. And so I had this blue collar mentality, thinking that because we're immigrants, because we are not naturally born in the United States, that we don't have the advantages that everyone else did. So it took a while for me to break that. And I, an American entrepreneur named Jim Franco, uh, he was a mentor to me. Uh, I became a personal trainer at the age of 21. And um, yeah, when you're a personal trainer, your clients are typically affluent people yeah. when they're hiring you. And little did I know I had built-in mentors. And this gentleman, Jim Franco, so I was 21. He's in his early 60s, 61. And he started to mentor me. He taught me how to become an entrepreneur, how to create value in exchange for money, how to solve problems. And he remembered one of the things he said, the more complex the problems that you solve, the more money you can make. The other thing he told me is, I said, Jim, well, how do you make your money? And he owned a software company. He said, I take a little bit of money from a lot of people. That clicked. And I can fast forward from that, that conversation a decade and see that the businesses that I built were all about solving problems in exchange for taking a little bit of money from a lot of people. And so it's, it, I almost had a rich dad and a poor dad. The poor dad taught me work ethic and money management because we didn't have a lot of it. But he also taught me to fear money and that none of it was around. My rich dad, Jim Franco, taught me that money is a byproduct of value and salesmanship. And so I was just really blessed to have two amazing dads mentor me. Um, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and that's sort of like sort of zeroing right into Robert Kiyosaki's book. Yeah, exactly. And, and, that, and that's his sort of philosophy, the two ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And they're both very valuable, both, both very important. Um, if I could just double down, because a lot of people will be looking at you better and saying, oh, well, it's all very well for me. He's, you know, did this, that, and the other. He's making lots of money. And th they just assume that they can't get there. And they probably um, – undervalue, and this is what I want to double down on, is work ethic. Now, it's very easy for us, you and I sit and say, oh, we worked hard and we watched that dad. My dad was the same as your dad, like, you know, worked, he was a milk run, then he'd go to his factory work, then he'd be a cleaner at that. You know, they're just sort of conversations. Like a lot of people go, well, they don't really know what it means. We get excited by it because we observed it. Sure. Um, and we lived it. Um, but when it comes to work ethic, maybe we could just double down, as I said earlier, uh, into – for me, it's not about just working hard. It's about feeling the need. It's nearly a need. I have to work hard. Like I don't have to work if, if in a financial sense these days, but if I couldn't work, I, I would be beside myself. I would be, I would be like I've lost a part of myself. Yeah. It's part of, it's my work ethic is part of how I live my life. Yeah. Um, maybe you could explain that, um, uh, how that sort of sits with you as part of your life. I mean, here you are in Australia, you probably don't need to do this, but you're doing it because people are always here to try and make a few bucks. It, yeah, you would like it to be commercially successful, I get all that part, but really there's a, a, a bigger part of all this. There's yeah. an ethic. You want to share something. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mark, but I think what you're trying to say is if – because you don't need to work. Like we, yeah. we all know who you are. You do not need to work. But you work because your sense of self-worth 
Your sense of self-worth comes from the work, your contribution to humanity. If you don't contribute, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I feel like if I don't contribute, then I feel worthless. I feel I'm like sorry. I don't, right? Yeah. Here, here's a, the, the harsh truth that I hope I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. I don't think a lot of people have that, meaning they, go, they, they say, man, if I had half the money that Mark did, if I had half the money that Bedros did, I'm retiring, yeah. I'm not going to work. Buy a boat and take a holiday. That's it. That's Buy the it. mortgage. I, I don't know if it's our parents, how they brought us up, or if it's a nature or nurture, if it's a genetic thing where my self-worth comes from production. I literally feel like a piece of shit if I do not contribute to humanity. I've raised my kids, Andrew and Chloe, to be value adders, to be problem solvers, to be an asset and not a liability. I was teaching them a PL report at six years old. And I said, listen, you have to be in the black column and not in the red column of humanity. I'm wired that way to add value. I don't know if that wiring is a byproduct of, again, nurture or nature. I can sense that you're wired that way. I think it's a gift that we have. And I do believe it's a muscle that people can develop because doesn't it feel good to do this podcast and to get messages from people to say, Mark, you've changed my perspective about money, about wealth, about generational wealth. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can change my family's trajectory in life. That feels good. Who doesn't want to experience that? And so I think the people who say that, man, if I just win the lottery or if I have half the money that you did, I'd buy a boat and retire never to be seen again. Yes, but I also think within a few months, you would start self-destructing. You would find a vice, alcohol, drugs, infidelity, pornography, whatever it is. And we are wired to serve. I'll give you a great example. I've got this beautiful dog. She's part German Shepherd, part Mastiff, a big dog. She's nine years old now. Um, we rescued her. She was eight months old and 80 pounds, uh, a very heavy dog, <laughs> big dog. We live in Southern California, so we flew to San Francisco, my son and I, when he was small. We rescued Cookie, her name is Cookie, and we drove back for eight hours. And in those eight hours, Andrew and Cookie bonded. We'd never had a big dog before, Mark. And so this dog was pulling my wife and kids all over the property like to the point where Chloe was falling on her face. We only had small dogs. And so we, I, I decided I'm going to get a dog trainer to come. This lady comes and works with Cookie for three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, calls me over. She says, this dog right here, <clears throat> you have to make sure that you have a routine with her. I said, what kind of routine? Well, maybe you can play fetch with her every morning. Throw the ball 10 or 12 times, make sure she fetches it. She's already bonded with your son. You have to make sure she bonds with your daughter and that she feels like she's protecting them, shepherding them. Okay, got it. And she says, I really want to make sure you're understanding me, sir. She could tell that I was rushed. Like, come on, lady, I've paid you. You've done the work. Thank you. Cookie is now, she sits, she heals, she walks. You could leave. She kept stressing the point. She said, if you don't do what I say with this dog, she will start getting depressed and anxious. And she'll start digging holes in your beautiful backyard in that rose garden. And she points to our rose garden. I said, how come? She said, in the absence of having a routine and the need to serve, she will start getting anxious and depressed and she will give herself something to do, which is to dig holes all over your backyard. We're no different as humans. If I don't have, if you don't have a sense of purpose, routine, the need to serve, we will start self-destructing and digging holes in our life. How that shows up could be, like I said, alcohol, drugs, pornography, food, you name it, social media. There's so many vices that, that people use to escape their realities from. I myself feel that my contribution to humanity will continue until I take my final breath, because if it doesn't, I will self-destruct. I will find a way to destroy myself. Um, I feel you probably feel the same way. I think most people are wired the same way. They just think that if they had the money, that they would go off on a boat somewhere. But we have the money, and here we are creating content to serve humanity. Yeah, but, and that's a very interesting uh take on the whole on the whole or a very interesting definition of the whole process and because I want to just take one step more and I, I don't want to sort of um, double down too much into the work ethic part but for me um, sometimes these types of virtues being a hard worker or being a person who's prepared to forgive somebody just you know having having these um, virtues characteristics in our makeup sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with this, it's nearly a selfish move mm -hmm. because, and there's nothing wrong with it 
because it's a good selfishness yeah. because there's a good outcome for everybody else, not yeah. just yourself. Yeah. It's a, let's, I hate the, the phrase win-win, but it is a win-win. Like you win, they win. And uh, to me, that's the best addiction you can have. Um, for me, and I wonder whether this is the case for you, I selfishly chase the work ethic. I selfishly chase um, helping others because – something happens in my brain, I don't know what the hell it is, it's some, probably some sort of uh, you know chemical that gets expressed in my brain that makes me feel good. I get rewarded mm -hmm. and it keeps me alive and it keeps me happy enough. Yeah. I don't mean happy, but just happy enough. Um, is that? Do you think that's the hallmark of an entrepreneur like you, that selfishness? That, it's not self-centered, yeah. but selfishness. Yeah, because there's two forms of selfishness. There's a selfishness that I could self-destruct and go inward and obviously be a bad example of humanity to my family, to my kids, to the world. And be hurtful. And be hurtful. Or I could be selfish in creating companies and organizations. Look, I've donated millions of dollars to Shriners Children's Hospital. These are a series of 22 hospitals across the United States that help children whose families can't afford medical procedures. Uh, a dear friend of mine, 13 years ago, uh, he was a police officer, very limited income. He had a child who needed a wheelchair, the spine was deformed. Shriners Children's Hospital helped that young man and when I found out, I said, when I become rich, I will keep donating as much as I can. Today, we've donated millions of dollars to Shriner Children's Hospital. I've got 97 kids adopted through Compassion International. Every Christmas, we spend anywhere from thirty to $50,000 in our community at the local uh, uh, Target store uh, to buy Christmas gifts for kids who would otherwise not have a Christmas gift Christmas morning. That sounds very... Like, gee, you're a really great human for doing that, Bedros. But it's also very fulfilling for me. It's the most selfish thing I do because as a, as a young boy, I was, I've dealt with sexual abuse, physical abuse. And one of the most healing things I do is to donate to these three charities that are all kid-based, child-based charities. It's not lost on me. It's absolutely selfish, but it creates a win. And it allows me to get that dopamine hit. It allows me to get that serotonin hit, which keeps me happy enough so that I don't self-destruct. Because I also realize I'm wired to self-destruct because of what's happened to me as a young man. I have enough self-awareness, and I've had a great therapist as well, explain to me that I will self-destruct. In fact, I asked my therapist many years ago, his name is Kevin, I said, Kevin, I've got seven companies and growing, we're donating millions of dollars, this is fantastic, I feel like I've got a new addiction. He said, great, do not stop this addiction. You are an addict, and if you do stop this addiction, you will be addicted to something that will destroy you. I said, well, then how long do I keep this going? He said, until you die. I said, check, got it. I don't ask a lot of questions from people who I feel are smarter than me. He said, keep going. He's good for me. I'll keep going until I die. So do you, so, I mean, it's funny. I'm glad I'm having, I'm having this conversation with you. By the way, the reason I do these shows is because I end up meeting people like yourself and I end up having some brilliant conversations, which I would otherwise never probably have the opportunity to have. Sure. And it lets me learn about myself. So selfishly, again, I'm, I'm learning right? about myself by talking to you about your experiences and- so, I mean, if we move beyond selfishness, um, and to some extent, it's about us becoming a, m more aware of ourselves. So, um, you know, for me, it's an awareness. So, you know, I've accepted that I do these things selfishly because at the end of the day, like you just said, I probably would self-destruct. Yeah. Because I do probably have an addictive personality in some respects. And, uh, you know, I've, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've experienced those times during my life. I'm a lot older now, but during those younger years when I didn't have great judgment um, relative to now, um, that I would probably do things were a bit destructive of me and people around me, and mm -hmm. like, which is terrible because I've got four sons. And, and they're usually the closest people around that, you. That, totally they are. They always are. Ex-wives, I've had three ex-wives. I've got, you know, I've got four sons. Um, I've, these days I've got three grandsons. But, like, I, I, I know what – the outcomes are because I'm self-aware. And I think that people listening to this and li having the opportunity to listen to someone like you in this environment, you know, they if they want to be entrepreneurs, there are a lot of traits that entrepreneurs have in common. Probably the most important thing though is to build self-awareness of yourself. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's great that someone like you makes these admissions uh, because a lot of people, you know, some entrepreneurs – don't want to say it. I don't know whether they want to keep it a secret or not, but they don't want to talk about why they act, what drives them. What drives me is self-awareness of if I don't do these things, I'm going to have a bad outcome. Yeah, I'm going to be sitting around thinking about what else can I get up to. 
even at my current age, I'm 68. Like even now, I was I was starting to think about. It. It's one of the reasons I wrestle with Larry, who you've mm-hmm. been wrestling with, yeah. and one of the reasons I used to box because it's sort of like a nearly like a self destruct thing. I've got to get in there and get roughed up, tested by someone like Larry, who's yeah. much better than probably both of us. And uh, you know, he's an expert. But it puts me, brings me back to ground, to reality all yeah. the time, mate. You know, just remember how old you are, who you are. You know, you're not uh, King Kong. I mean, do you go through those same processes Absolutely. yourself? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I have currently have a torn tricep, and it was because last year I was boxing, testing myself, challenging myself, and as I went to throw a left cross, I got checked, and pop went my tricep. I've done that. Okay. Five years ago. I had, to get, re- I had to get reconnected, though. There you go. I have to get mine reconnected. I just haven't made time for it yet. Uh, and, and so that, again, grounds me. It reminds me that who I am, that I'm not indestructible like I used to think I was, that there is repercussions to actions. We need that, especially we're, we're type A, tightly wound, high speed. When, when people say describe yourself, I say type A, tightly wound, high speed. And I can immediately spot someone just like me. We're cut from the same cloth. Like I, as soon as I met you, I'm like type A, tightly wound, high speed. Like this man will lose interest very quickly or he will lock on to a conversation if it interests him. And that's how I am. And again, I think most people can get there, but it takes a high level of self-awareness. And I think the question to ask is, how do we develop a high level of self-awareness? That is the question. Right? Can you, what's your, what is your view? It is to bring down your ego defenses. Because as men, especially, male entrepreneurs, especially, and this is where women, I believe, are much better than us in this category. We are driven, 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 driven to, to create an outcome. We want to kill, fuck, and conquer. That's what men want to do. And so it takes a high level of ego to stay focused on that, to think that you're better than everybody else, that no one else can do what you do, and that I'm indestructible, and I will build a team, share my vision with my team, and we will attack the goal. But at what cost? And so if you can bring your ego defenses down, you can bring up your self-awareness. Ego goes up, self-awareness goes down. Those two things are related. I learned that 11 years ago at the age of 38, uh, when I had a massive panic attack, I thought it was a heart attack. Uh, And I remember thinking, who's going to walk Chloe down the aisle if I die right now? Who's going to teach Andrew, my son, to be a modern day? And I remember thinking to myself, if I could just be spared, I'll change my ways. Needless to say, it wasn't a heart attack. It was a panic attack of many that I would have subsequently. But it took reducing my ego, realizing that I'm not indestructible, that I don't have the answers to everything, that I do need to yield at times. And also, you know this, with time comes wisdom. Time plus experience is wisdom. Age. Yeah, right? And, and, and so as the ego goes down, self-awareness comes up, and you realize I am human. I need to serve. If I stop serving, I self-destruct. So you, know, you hit on the, on the very topic, the entrepreneur, and also ego versus awareness self-awareness this week and i don't want to be indelicate but uh one of the one of america's biggest entrepreneurs and you know he managed to make it, get himself voted in as the president of the united states yeah um you know there's not much more you can do as an entrepreneur in life um you know you go from a, a businessman to becoming the president not a career uh, politician but you know i'm going to become the president that's that's the dude he did it and trump did that yeah um he got uh, grazed. If it had to been a couple of millimeters, or in your case, a centimeter. Uh, in your case, an inch. I mean, American uh, system. Yep. He might have, um, you know, been, been in a dreadful position, um, and USA could have been in a bit of chaos. Because I would have thought, well, you tell me. Uh, it seems to be division in the United States. And uh, do you think do you think there would have been an overreaction? if something had happened to him? Yeah, there, let, let's just be honest. There was an attempted assassination yep. on, pre, on former President Trump. Um, they tried to cancel him. Then they tried to stop him using the court system, the legal system. And the third and final attempt is an assassination. This was an assassination attempt that did not work out. I don't know if God's hand, I don't know if it was God's hand, I don't know if it was just sheer luck that he turned his head in the right moment that the bullet grazed his ear instead of hitting him in the back of the head and killing him. Whatever it was, I believe if that bullet had hit the intended target in the head, Trump in the head, and he died, we would have seen the breakout of civil war. Because sadly, and it breaks my heart, man, my dad risked his life, risked our life to bring us to the United States. The United States today is not the United States that I came to. 
the United States that I came to, yes, it still had problems, but people were somewhere in the middle. Today, it's so divisive. It's so divided. And I believe that if Trump had died, that would be the final straw that would send the country into civil war. Well, I, I, maybe you can help me out here because I just don't understand where it came from. We have a little bit of division here, nowhere near to the extent what we observe in the US at the moment, and probably the same in the UK at the moment too, and perhaps other places. But what do you think it is? Um, like they are so diametrically opposed, Biden and Trump, So and the red and blue and the left and the right, so diametrically opposed. Like it's just like a, so much so that when I watch TV, I'll go from CNN to Fox, like your stations, mm -hmm. and they're completely different. Come, well, I'll give you a great example. When it ha when the assassination attempt happened uh, this past Saturday, July yeah. 13th, CNN said Pre President Trump was whisked away by Secret Service after a fall, after he fell during his, his press conference. You go to Fox News and it says President Trump just faced an attempted assassination and Secret Service whisked him away. That's how far the story is. So if you only, if you have tunnel vision and you're only getting your news from CNN, and just so you know, I'm neither left or right. I'm right down the middle. I'm right down the middle. I'm a constitutionalist. Let's just go by the constitution. And by the way, you know, that my family and I, we went to dinner in Southern California about two weeks ago. There's this beautiful road car called Carbon Canyon, 13 miles of twisting turns that connects Brea and Chino Hills, my city and the city that we were having dinner in. 10 o'clock at night, I said, hey, let's go through this beautiful scenic road. And as we come around one of the corners, we see two cars that have just crashed into each other, a Tesla and a, um, a Mitsubishi hatchback. A uh, young Asian man in one, Hispanic lady in another, uh, a, a white couple had just pulled over to help them out. And you're probably wondering, why is he naming off ethnicities? No police yet, no fire department, nothing. I've got a first aid kit. I'm first aid cer certified. I pulled over, had my wife call 911 while my son and I ran out to help. In that moment, the young man with the gash on his head, I could see his skull, the woman in the Tesla with the bloody nose and the white folks who stopped. No one asked me and I didn't ask them, what is your political affiliation? We just wanted to help. I believe that's most of America. That's most of the citizens. The divisiveness has taken place now where the extreme on the left and the extreme on the right have gotten so loud and social media is a great amplifier mm. of the extremes. That's it. It's a great amplifier of the extremes. And I remember driving off thinking, you know, I don't know that guy's sexual orientation. I don't know if he votes Trump or Biden. Quite honestly, I don't care if he's a transsexual unicorn. He needed help. I was there to patch him up. The police came. I drove off. That's it. Yet on social media, he could very well tell me to go F off and pound sand. And so I realized that social media amplifies divisiveness. Most people who are in the middle, we just want to have a good life. We want a secure community. We want to make sure there's some legacy for our family, et cetera. Those on the extremes are the ones, the squeaky wheels that require the oil that are amplified. Why this has amplified so much post pandemic, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I can tell you that there seems to be, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, there seems to be an agenda to erode the American constitution and to get, get more control and compliance over the population. And that I don't agree with. Do you, do you think it's, is it social media though, amplifying it on purpose or is it the extreme left and extreme right um, leveraging social media to achieve their purpose? I think it's the latter. It's the extreme left and extreme right leveraging social media. And a great example of this, we saw when Elon purchased Twitter, he proved that certain accounts, certain voices were muffled, were throttled, were, were turned off. Uh, and in fact, the FBI had a finger in the whole process. He exposed everything. And so now who's given the FBI the orders to reach out to Twitter and to decide who gets a voice and who doesn't? Because Twitter, for the most part, was America's town hall. It's kind of yeah. how we look at it, right? 
And so who, originally, originally, originally. Yeah. So who's giving those orders? I don't know. Is there a deep state? I don't know. And so I go back to what I know, which is I will take an internal locus of control. I know the people who I care for, I will look out for them. I will take control of my own finances. I will create my own sovereignty. I will have my thoughts. I will curate the thoughts that occupy my mind, whether it's I listen to the radio, a podcast, television, social media, news media, it doesn't matter. I control the thoughts that occupy my mind and the people I surround myself with. Those two things have the highest influence on my behavior and then my behavior determines my outcome in life. And so I don't know what is going on in the United States. I don't know why there was an assassination attempt on our president. I don't know why the Secret Service uh, for a good 48 seconds or 47 seconds, knew where the bad guy was and did not shoot him, why they waited for him to take shots off. I could go down the rabbit hole like every other American and start wringing my hands over conspiracy theories. How is that going to help me make more money, have more meaning, and develop self-mastery? It's not. And so while I'm fully aware of what's going on, I choose to control what I can't control, concentrate on what counts, and then cope with what I can't control. And I think if more people did that, the three C's, control what you can control, concentrate on what counts, and cope with what you can't control, I think we would all live a better life, no matter if you're in the States or in Australia. So do you think, in your case at least, is your advice then to listeners and anybody for that matter who seeks your advice, extract yourself from the noise? It's the only way. Yeah, but, but because people do get caught up in the conspiracy because it is sort of interesting. I it mean, is. I mean, it's sort of more some, – some people are obsessed by it, but there also is a curiosity around it. Like, oh, can you imagine there's someone, as you say, like uh, sitting in the background and there's a whole movement sitting around them and they've been infiltrated all these various places and uh, they're all acting in concert at the same time. Right. And there's a supreme ruler of this uh, conspiracy and, uh, you know, and we don't know who this person will be. It's nearly 007 stuff. Um, but it, it, at, the, at the end of the day, it amounts to nothing for us, any one of us, normal people, an extraction of yourself from the noise, but at the same time still listening to it. H how do you do that? How do you manage extract, but at the same time still be engaged yeah. a little bit? Yeah. Awareness, but not addiction. Be aware of what's happening, but don't be so addicted to the chaos that you forget what's happening here. And I'll give you a, a smaller example. On my show, on my YouTube show, I always talk about this, and I and I and I re men for it. I say, you know your favorite baseball team, your favorite basketball team, your favorite football team. You know all the players. You know their stats. You know who got traded, where, and how, and how much they're making, and what they're at. You know, batting averages. You don't know your own fucking anniversary. You don't know your kids' <laughs> birthdays. You don't know exactly how much money you have in your bank account. You don't know what your financial trajectory is. Yet you carry the name. You wear the jersey. You wear a jersey with another man's name on your back and you don't own the team. And I'm not opposed to rooting for teams. Like I yeah. said, tonight I'll be watching the game and I'll be rooting for, uh, who am I rooting against? New South Wales. New South Wales. Just want to make the sure. Blues. The, the Blues. The Blue Jersey. Got it. Got it. But I do have a big problem when people are fully invested in that, yet they're going broke here. Their relationship is a mess. Their kids are addicted to social media and they're depressed, yet yet they're fully watching what's happening with Biden and Trump. It doesn't matter if Biden goes back into office or Trump goes into office or they bring in Gavin Newsom from California. Who gives a crap? I control what happens in my family and my economy more than anyone sitting in the White House. And, that, that, and that's a, like that, that. I think that's an extremely good point in terms of, term, in terms of advice to people around mindset because we waste a lot of time and we yeah. don't have much time. Time is a bit mostly precious resource. By I far. can make more money. I can't make more time. You, 100%. And you must make as much money as you can and as much enjoy as much of the time as you can. So therefore you've got to eliminate those wastage areas where you don't influence it. You have no control over it. You mentioned your YouTube your YouTube channel. Yeah. Just take me through that. What are you doing on your YouTube channel? Let's, let's, let's um, hear about that. What do you I, do? I, I created a show called The Bedros Cooling Show and this was on the heels of the pandemic. Um, I, I knew something was going on. Specifically, there was an attack on masculinity. There was an attack on the way that men are. You're competitive. You, you want to build a legacy you want to acquire things and the, everything that a man is, you want to speak your mind and everything that I just said that a man is, is considered toxic. And I couldn't figure out why. And I, and it dawned on me one day post pandemic, about a year and a half into the pandemic, I realized, you know, remember we're in the United States. And so Canada is right above the United States. So 
and I'm explaining this to the CEO of my company, Bryce. I said, Bryce, if you and I wanted to put together a military so that we can attack Canada, we're going to take over Canada. I said, Bryce, do we, do we care about the children of Canada standing in opposition against us? He said, well, no, of course not. Do we care about the elderly in Canada standing in opposition against our army as we invade? I said, no, of course not. Do we care about the women standing in opposition against us? Do they have a chance? He said, no, of course not. I said, the only opposition would be Canadian able-bodied men to stand in opposition against us as we attempt to take Canada. He said, yes. In so, that, that, that's your target. Yeah. yeah. Right? The others are not your target. Exactly. Children, women, elderly, but we're talking about the men. Yeah. So if I want to not shed any blood and I want them to hand Canada over to me, the easiest way will be not to march into Canada with guns and rifles and missiles, but to spend several years demoralizing and deconstructing the men, making them feel that they are toxic, they are, they are not to act that the way that God has intended them to act and behave, to build and to want legacies and to acquire and to question things and to think freely and to come together. Everything that we've been seeing happening post-pandemic is to dismantle masculinity because men, us men, we are the greatest threat to the opposition. And if they can get greater levels of control and compliance over men, then they have greater control over and compliance over the country. And I believe that's what's happening. And so I started my podcast with the intention of empowering men and helping them become free thinkers, unite as men, create money. My whole show is based on money, meaning, and self-mastery. If you can create money, money is a vehicle to freedom. Money is a vehicle to access. You and I both know that money, there's levels to the game that we play. Uh, and I'm nowhere near your level, Mark, but I could only imagine at the Mark level, like, holy smokes, right? But the quality of my life right now, the access that I have to people, I could drive up and down in any one of my cars on the highway that I've adopted. My company's name is on my highway, Highway 71 and Chino Hills on both ends. The litter, uh, litter pickup is adopted by Fit Body Bootcamp. And I can speed up and down that highway and the police will pull me over. Oh, hey, Bedros, and they'll let me keep going. Now, I'm not bragging about that. What I'm saying is, I use my money to influence. And so I could imagine how money is used to influence our politicians and to act and, and support specific things. And I share that with you because men need to acquire more money. They need to have greater senses of meaning and purpose. We are no men, especially are very much like my dog cookie. We need to have purpose. We need to have significance. We need to have meaning. If we don't, we will self-destruct. And then we of course need self-mastery. You know, stop your addictions, your vices, you know, pornography, infidelity, and develop to the higher level self, the self that's connected to God, to universal consciousness, to whatever your higher power is. And if we can have more money, more meaning, more self-mastery, we can prevent the opposition, government, and the lobbying, pharmaceutical companies, and food conglomerates, and the military industrial complex from influencing the government to oppress us further. But and, it's, and it's sort of like a, a it's sort of like a, a bit of a new concept. I mean, it's maybe only five or six years. I mean, sure, we had movements where men had to become much more aware of how they operate. Like that, and I think that's probably fair enough. Yeah. But there has been a movement against, uh, in Australia at least, uh, white, male, homosexual, uh, heterosexual, heterosexual, like, uh, which is you know I got four sons and three grandsons, like and. I'm, I've, all of us at this stage fit into that category. Um, but like I, my mother's like a goddess to me. I mean, she passed away, but she was like a god to me. Sure. And my mother was the biggest influence in my life. And uh, women are extraordinarily important to me in, in my family, in, in my life. Extra, I'm, I'm, I might have been divorced three times, but that's I'm still good mates with all of them. And uh, I still talk to them as, and I have a high, highest regard for them, particularly those who are mothers of my kids. Um, I, I'm always scratching my head. Where did this whole program come from? I mean, do you think is it like, and I don't want to get down the conspiracy uh, hole, but is it um, why would anyone be trying to break down what has always been? I, I think every January first, there's new laws enacted. 
Have you, you've been around for a long time. You said you're 68. Hmm. Have you ever celebrated a New Year's Day where the news didn't say, hey, there's no new laws and no new regulations? Mm -hmm. Every year in the United States, uh, I think there's 1,300 new federal laws that are passed. On average, 1,300. Statewide, about 600 new laws. So I look at it this way. If there's a noose around our head, around our neck, every year that noose gets tighter and tighter. More regulation. More regulation, more yeah. laws. There's never a year there where they say, hey, there's, we took away 13 new laws, uh, old laws, and you have more freedom. Yeah, you have yeah. more freedom, right? You can pay less taxes. You can just go into Australia without a passport or a visa because you're a human. You're a, you're a, you're a human. Look, man, a, a whale can, can swim from Australia to Mexico to the United States and to Vancouver, B.C. I don't see a whale carrying a passport and looking for a visa. You and I can't do that. We're not as free as we think. Who is trying to control us? I don't know. I do know that there's control and compliance. The noose is getting tighter for a reason. I do know that if they force, again, call this conspiracy or not, but if they are forcing a shot on you, a vaccine on you, and saying that otherwise you can't open up your business, your kids can't go to school. Which happened here. Which happened here. It happened there in the United States. It happened in Canada. Uh, otherwise, it will freeze your financial bank accounts. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. At, at what point in history was it okay to start doing that? And who is going to be the opposition to stop that? Men, not the women, not the children, not the elderly. It'll be the men standing up in opposition against big government and the pharmaceutical companies that are lobbying, bribing. Let's just call it what it is. It's not lobbying. It's bribing big government. How the fuck does Nancy Pelosi have better stock option picks? She can pick stocks better than Warren Buffett. <laughs> How does that happen? You have to ask yourself the question. Someone's is, telling you. Is that insider trading? Of course it is. If I were to do that, I'd be locked up. You You'd never see me again. Yeah. And so let's, let's, let's clean up what needs to be cleaned up. So I don't know who the puppet masters are, but I don't have to know that there's a puppet master. I don't have to see the fire if I can smell the smoke. And, and just, so I'm going to react to it. It's a, and I, I, I quickly give you a quick, a quick short story about that because you just reminded me of something. And I, again, I, I, neither one of us want to be conspiracists. I mean, I'm not, I'm not into conspiracy theories. But in Australia, and in Sydney in particular, we had one individual who brought COVID into Australia by virtue of being a high car driver who picked up some people who were from an airline. They were like, um, you know, pilots and stuff like that and had to drive them to a hotel. And those individuals had COVID. And this particular driver stopped in a, a shop around near where I lived and to buy coffee. And when the individual was in that coffee shop, I went into that coffee shop to buy myself a coffee because I was going to my farm. I was, I was on the way to the airport. I just went to the takeaway. And I came, went to the farm, came back two days later. I, got a, I was getting these random phone calls by a private number and someone had an actually American accent on the things saying that I needed to call them. I just ignore them. In the next thing, then that day, the police turned up to my house. And they said, uh, you need to call this number that's been calling you. And they knew me. I knew the cops. And uh, I said, oh, okay. And they said, it's the Department of Health. So I rang the health department. And they said, well, you know, you're now quarantined for 14 days because you were outside the shop. I said, hey, how did you even know I was there? They said, you paid by your credit card. We rang your bank and we the banks and got – the, so we got all the bank details from everyone and we rang every single person with the, so I had, who went there and bought coffee from a credit card. I wasn't even in the shop. I was outside the shop. I remember the dude in there because I remember hearing him cough. Um, I got uh, uh, locked in my house for 14 days. It wasn't that bad, but, you know, I'm lucky I live in a nice place, blah, blah, blah. But I can't imagine what it would be like if I lived in a, a one-bedroom apartment like your family did when you first came to right. America, you know, with a couple of kids and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I, I'm lucky, but still, I was still locked in my house. They would ring me every single day, the health department, every day. To check in. To check check where I was. And one day I thought I decided to turn my uh, my location services off on my phone. That afternoon the police called up. Imagine that. And I thought to myself, you know, at the time it was sort of not that big a deal. Like I, I just thought it was a bit annoying. But, you know, now post-COVID and post all these bloody vaccinations that we had to get in order to travel, um, I, I think to myself – that was really was stealing my my freedom. Absolutely, you know, like, it was, like if your I sovereignty the, was your sovereignty was was eroded. If I had the flu, I'm still free to go to coffee shop. I mean, my responsibility is marked. Don't go to work or don't be close to someone or lock yourself up mm -hmm. in, at the office. But not, I'm going to get the police to make sure you stay home. And 
I think a lot of people around the world have realized, are starting to realize, I should say, this outcome. And uh, I think there are a lot of people around the world who want to take more control of over our, what you call sovereignty, our rights, our actual rights. I mean, yeah. you guys got a, uh, you, you guys got um, something that amends your constitution giving people human rights. We don't have that in Australia. We don't actually have a bill of human rights. Right. We don't have that. Which is scary to me. It's very scary. And, uh, and in each state of Australia, they can operate differently. So in the United States, at least things are more uniform. Um, and I often wonder to myself, where are we going with all this? And what are our kids going to, how are our kids going to live their lives and our grandkids going to live their lives? And I, I guess that, you know, a person like you putting yourself out there, having a YouTube series to talk about this sort of stuff is sort of fairly courageous because, you, you, you know, people come after you. Sure, I get my fair share of death threats. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do, yeah. Yeah. And, and and in America, you've got to take that stuff very seriously. Seriously. Yeah, and we have precautions for it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Because, you know, Australia, we don't, we, we don't have guns. People don't have guns. Or we have, you know, you, there's laws around uh, possessing a firearm. It's not that easy to get a gun. Mind you, you know, people are getting stabbed here left, right, and center. There's no, sure. no rules about getting stabbed. And they take away knives, people will get run over by cars. Yeah, totally. Or they'll hit you over the back of the head with a bat or something like that. Right. So, you know, so I, I think it's a really courageous thing you're doing. Like, uh, you know, having a YouTube series, it's called, what's it called? Uh, it's just the Bedros Cooling just Show. Just your name. My Bed name. And how many episodes have you done? Uh, we are now 94 episodes in, and the show has blown up, which is what, what made me come to Australia in the first place when Rob Theo and his wife, yeah. um, who, who you know well, yeah. they, they found my show. They resonated with the message. They said, you have to come out and speak in our three, three cities, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. And so this is why I'm here. Um, and and I'm, while I'm grateful for it, I hope we reach a time where my message, I hope I never have to do my show. I hope we reach a time where there's so much freedom and sovereignty that we don't have to worry about big government oppressing us. And forget about us. I'm worried about my kids, my grandkids. How much tighter is the noose around their neck going to get before, you know, like yesterday we were at a nice restaurant. I ordered a nice ribeye, Wagyu, A5 steak. Are my kids going to be eating dehydrated grasshopper? Their kids going to be eating <laughs> like what are they going to eat? Right? I don't want that for them. I I am the American dream, and I believe my father bringing me here, like he risked his life. I have to risk my life in saving and supporting the American dream. And I know whether you live in Sydney, Australia, or if you live in Paris, France, the American dream is a worldwide phenomenon, and I have to support that. Yeah, that that's uh. For Australians, um, we look up to Americans because of the American dream. I sure. mean, we follow your TV shows. We follow just about everything you guys do. We, we tend to do here in Australia. Problem is now we're tending to follow some of the stuff that's happening in America relative to politics. Right. And, uh, you know, we are getting the divide between left and right. And it's nearly like you have to make a decision. It's nearly like in this country today you must make a decision. You're either left or you're right, Mark. That's unfortunate. Yeah, but I shouldn't have to make a decision. I want to be in the middle. Yeah. Do you think there will be some stage – a political party that'll come up and say, look, we're called the moderates or we're called the middle party or something along those lines and actually garner all the votes of everybody and actually take on the left and the right, someone right down the middle. I think we're getting there. I yeah. think we're getting there. I think that here's what's happening. Because of inflation, because of high interest rates, and now, as you see, everyone is experiencing the financial burden of this. No matter how left you are, how extreme you are, how liberal you are, you're experiencing the financial burden. And for the first time, people are realizing that, you know what? I'm left, extreme left, but I'm barely able to pay my rent, my car note, all these things. Maybe I need to come more center. Now, I'm not saying right, because the right has its own issues as well. Yeah. Somewhere in the center is where the rest of us want to live. And I believe there's like, 70% of us, 70, 75, 80% of us are in the middle, and then there's a 10%, 15% on either side that are going batshit crazy, yet they are the loudest, they are the most vocal, and it is amplified by social media, and therefore we feel that the whole world is divided. And what do we naturally want to do as humans anyway? Like you said, the, the game is happening tonight. We want to divide into teams. And so they're using our natural instinctive desire to divide into to teams. To be tribal. To be tribal. And if we can divide men, by you are pro-vaccine, you are not pro-vaccine. You're pro-gay, you're not pro-gay. You're pro-police, you're not pro-police. Pro-abortion or pro-abortion. Pro yeah, there's so many pros and cons. We can divide in faction that small clusters of men can do nothing. And when men come together as a tribe, we are invincible. So in that regard, um, how do you keep your energy up? I know you've got this bo a business called Fit Body Bootcamp. Yeah, yeah. So did you do that 
initially to keep your own fitness up? I mean, what's the deal there? Because, I mean, because for me, I cannot operate unless I feel physically fit. Right. If I feel like shit, um, I will operate like shit. Yeah. So yeah. I have to force myself on a routine. I have a, a, a really, like, I can't live without my routine. Like uh, last week I had to do a bit of traveling. I was in hotels, various other things. That just like the gym whole scene wasn't right for me. At the end of the week, I wasn't depressed, but I felt a little bit flat. Yeah. Um, and I'm so good. To, I'm so glad to be back into my routine. Um, what's your fit body boot camp? What's that about? And wh- how's your routine look? So I, I used to be a fat, overweight young man. Really? E- even throughout high school. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. True story. True story. Yeah, being, you know, being an immigrant to this country, my mom would fry everything and we'd eat it. So it was like fried bread, fried potato. Fry, you, you but is that an Armenian thing? But it that, is an Armenian that, thing. That, that's how you eat? That yeah, would of eat. course, yeah. But they'd be working in the fields or something. They'd be, uh, yeah, uh, except yeah. I wasn't working in yeah. the fields because now it's 1980, 1985, yeah. 1990, right? And so I was a fat kid. And thankfully, in one of my one of my high school classes in science class, there was an athlete. He played football. His name is Dave. I said, Dave, you're in great shape, man. You have muscles, you have confidence, you have swagger. He wouldn't talk to me outside of the class because he was with the athletes and the jocks. The musicians were over here and the fat, you know, I wasn't even a nerd. So I can't even say I had good grades and the nerds hung out over there. The foreign fat kid would just walk around. I I hated lunch in high school. because that's right, we called them wogs. There you go. That's, that was me. I was one of them. Yeah, come. so you can relate. And I do believe that also put a chip on my shoulder to help me become who I am today. And chips on your shoulder help, by the way. Absolutely. And so... Dave was kind enough to take me to the school gym and he taught me how to work out, taught That's me how cool. to eat right. Next uh, next year I come back, which is my final year of high school. I'm 30 pounds lighter, more fit, more charismatic, more confidence, making eye contact with people, getting noticed for the first time as though I never went to school there, right? I was invisible for three years and I'm invisible. So <clears throat> I realized, man, I love what fitness did for me. I want to be a personal trainer and I want to have others achieve and experience this transformation. So that led me to becoming a personal trainer. That led me to starting a group training program called Fit Body Bootcamp. And now we have hundreds of locations between the US and Canada, over 350 locations wow. and growing. Yeah, it's a, it's a fitness franchise. And to me, if I can keep my, if I can have good mental, physical and emotional hygiene, I am invincible. And so to me, even this morning, I woke up, I went through my morning routine, I worked out and I will work out again tonight before I go to bed. I have two workouts a day. I I shield myself from the outside noise that I don't want to subscribe to. I travel with only the people who are positive um, in terms of contribution to my life. And I'm very vigilant with how I live my life. You know, hey, be strict, very strict To, to the point of militant. Yeah. And the older I get, the more militant I become. Uh, you're 68, I'm 49. As you said, you, you said, hey, I wasn't depressed when I came back home, but you said I was flat. Yeah. Here I am in beautiful Sydney. I'm flying to Melbourne tonight, going to Brisbane after that and back to Sydney and then back to California. I can't wait to get home and get back to my routine. Get back to my routine. Uh, the more predictable my life is. And people ask me, well, where's the spontaneity? I don't have spontaneity. I don't want spontaneity. I want a predictable, happy, successful, healthy life. And that's what I have. So how, how, how important then, therefore, do you think for others, if you could share this, is a routine and structure within your life? Like in terms of – people keep saying to me, mindset, mindset. For me, mindset means about structuring something uh, and structuring my mind in a certain way. And the only thing I can think of is routine. Uh, I, I can't think of much more. I mean routine – to do different things, and I, I go. I'm a bit like yourself. I'm, I'm extreme. I get right down to the time I go to bed at night. It's non-negotiable unless mm-hmm. I'm going to go to something that's like a function or something. It's non-negotiable if I'm home. Um, what I actually do before I go to sleep, um, you know, there's a few things like routines I go through to make sure that I'm in a sleep mode. What time I wake up in the morning, even down to the point which gym or gyms I go to. Go. I noticed you. Know, for those who don't know, um, uh, Bedros, uh, his team reached out to me before he came here, and uh, he wanted to go somewhere where he could practice jujitsu. Was and the place I uh, recommended is a jujitsu dash wrestling sort of place. It's an MMA place, which he did. He's been there um, already. He only been there for a few days. Um, that's that's sort of to me um, extreme routine commitment yeah and, and i will keep that exp- i mean you what you described is like my morning starts the night before yeah what time i go to bed what little rituals i go through the hot tub the tea one episode of the tv show that my my wife and i watch um all of it all what are you of watching it. what are you watching uh we are <laughs> we are currently watching um oh geez what is the name of the show 
Is it comedy or is it drama? No, no, I, I hate I hate drama. I love. I, I, we just finished watching right now the the fourth and final, sorry, the third part of Arnold's documentary on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But previous to that, uh, we were watching Veep. So, what's Veep about? Julia Julia Louise Dreyfus. So the the woman who was on Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She is the Veep, Vice President of the United States. Right. She is hilarious. It's it is just tight. foul. It is bananas. She can't wait for the president to die for her to step into his shoes. And every time she gets a call, she's hoping that the president is dead. Oh, he's in the hospital. Well, I will be there to to to, to see him, to give my condolences. I mean, to make sure he's doing well. And so I love good comedies. But we, again, make sure that we only watch one episode and not go down the drain of, you know, binge watching other. an entire season. But it's, it's, it's funny because I do the same sort of thing, but I, I, I watch something neutral to neutralize my thought processes. Yeah. I mean, what about meditation? I love meditating. I, so in the mornings I'll meditate. I'll drink 30 ounces of water. I'll even turn on. How much is 30 ounces of water? Uh, it's, uh, it's about a liter. 30 ounces of water is, oh gosh, it's a fourth of a gallon. Okay, a quarter, really quarter of a gallon. Gallons, uh, a quarter of a gallon. Uh, is eight pints. So it's uh, two pints, which is close to a, a liter. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a lot of water. That's it. Yeah. So within, within 30 minutes of waking up, I've, I've drank the 30 ounces of water. I've sent out three gratitude text messages. Uh, to, to whom? To, to three random people in my life that yeah. I'm grateful for. Yeah. Uh, who have helped me. Could be Jim Franco, my first mentor. It yeah. could be someone, uh, you know, one of my business partners. Could be my wife. Anyone that I'm grateful for. I make sure to put myself in a state of gratitude. You know this. As an entrepreneur, no matter how structured your day is, you're going to get a call or a text or an email that's going to piss yeah, you off. It's going to piss you off. Or so, make you feel like shit. Exactly. So again, remember we were talking about creating that win-win scenario, the most selfish thing we can do. Well, if I send Mark a gratitude text message when I wake up, sometime throughout his day, Mark's going to send me a thank you message. And I don't know why the universe works this way, but that thank you message from you will come exactly when I needed it, when I needed to hear it, because something's going wrong in my business or in my life, which is normal. Like I love chaos and my problem is to fix chaos faster than it can produce itself. That's what entrepreneurs do. We fix problems faster than problems can reproduce. And so the most selfish thing I can do is send gratitude text messages because that guarantees me three positive text messages every single day. And back. you can bank them. I can bank them. Yeah. That's it. It's currency. Yeah. I listen to Jack Johnson's music while I'm showering. Oh, I, I haven't heard Jack for ages, but whatever happened uh, to Jack? Like, you know, I don't, I not many new albums out, but I love his stuff. No, every now and again, chilled. Yeah, he'll randomly just put something out. But he, he does a concert once a year where I surf in Dana Point, California. And so I always go to, you know, the family and I go to see him. Um, I love his music. It makes me happy right? Talk about something neutral, makes me happy. Then I'll go downstairs, meditate for about 15 minutes, and then I attack my work. And I say, I use the word attack. I know it sounds extreme, but I attack my work. And as Joan is sitting there, she'll tell you, money tasks first. Things that will make money first, and then I'll start solving problems that have come through the night via email from my chain of command, my team members, etc. cetera. Uh, and then I go to the gym, get my workout in, go outside and walk for about three miles at the local park. And then I'll go to headquarters by 12 noon, and then my second half of the day starts. So part part one of my day starts at home. Part two starts at headquarters. Um, and I might, you know, coach or consult some, some coaching clients. I might make some big decisions or small decisions, a series of small decisions. Or I might make a few episodes of my podcast show. Mm -hmm. By 6 p.m. I'm at home and it's family time and my phone notifications are off. Because even if the building at home at work catches fire... I'm not a firefighter. What can I do <laughs> other than worry about it? So I'll find out in the morning when my CEO tells me. Now that's, that's So it's very, very disciplined. Yeah. And is this seven days a week? Do, I mean, do you have a uh, – what about food in terms of you – know, I just I, follow I, my macros in terms of food. So, what's that mean? Uh, so uh, my proteins, fats, and carbs. So I'll have about 250 grams of protein per day. And I break it up into four meals. I can't – six, seven meals I don't have time for. 250 grams of protein a day, about 150 to 200 grams of carbs a day, and 60 to 80 grams of fat a day. And usually the fat will come from olive oil, avocado, et cetera. Uh, and, and I love routine, I love routine, I love routine. Now yesterday we went and had steak, like I said, I got a little dessert, I got sherbet, uh, sorbet, as they all might say, and I had a little bite, a couple bites, and I pushed a plate away. I'm a fat kid, so I could eat every, I don't have an off button. So I have to deliberately go, in, and that's why I have to be disciplined, I have to be structured, I have to be militant. I can eat, I can, out eat anybody and I can out lazy anybody 
but I love financial freedom. I love serving humanity so much. I love being fit and athletic so much that I have to be this disciplined and this militant. And I do it seven days a week. Like, why on the weekends would I wake up and be lazy, wake up late, be lazy, only to set myself up to lose on a Monday? Because think how quickly our body builds habits and patterns. Yeah. So if I'm lazy on Saturday and I get a little drunk and tipsy, and then on Sunday I sleep in, I get a little drunk and tipsy, Monday, arguably the busiest day for an entrepreneur, now I'm at a deficit. I don't want that. Difference is on the weekends, I'm not working eight, nine hours, but I'll work a couple hours before the family wakes up, still be productive, still feel some self-worth, and then go out there and have fun with the family, whether it's surfing or whatever. And, and in terms of sleep, for those who are listening, because a lot of people in business find it difficult to sleep, what's your sleep mantra? So, I mean, we, we listen to Peter Tier and uh, Andrew Hoobman and various other people like Simon Hill in Australia. Um, you know, you've got to get between seven, eight hours and it's got to be a certain type of sleep. Uh, what's your sleep regime or, and or strategy look like? So as early as eight, seven, eight years ago, I would function with four to five hours of sleep. And I almost scoffed at anybody who would get seven or eight hours of sleep. Today at 49 years old, I require seven to eight hours of sleep and that's a non-negotiable. I, I stopped drinking alcohol two years ago simply because it interrupted my sleep pattern. And I was not a addict where alcohol is. I would have a couple of cocktails here and there. But I noticed as I got older, I would feel a little foggy. It would interrupt my sleep. It wasn't a deep sleep. I like to eat earlier in the day. Um, instead of a, you know, our culture especially, we like to eat at 8, 30, 9 p.m., right? Well, shoot, I got to be in bed by 10 o'clock, man. I can't do that. I like to eat at 6 p.m. for dinner. And so I've adjusted my, my eating, my alcohol, et cetera, to help me sleep deeper and longer at night, which makes me more productive. I don't know if it's a byproduct of getting older or if all those years of sleeping four or five hours have now caught up with me, but I require my sleep. And it's funny, you know, during that younger years, I mean, I, I experienced the same thing. It was like you were, it was like a, a, a superpower of people who are good entrepreneurs to be able to go without sleep. In other words, how do you do it? You get four to five hours sleep at night, yet you can work, you know, 14, 15 hours a day. And I actually think it was all bullshit. I actually don't think, I don't believe anyone has said it. I mean, I used to do it, but I, I would then crash. After right, about exactly. Six or seven days. And, and these people used to say to me, I know, I, I, I've ne I never do that. I, I sleep four or five hours, you know, and I've been doing it for years. I just, I don't know. I, I now think I don't believe them because um, it is like a bit of a superpower sort of, uh, you know, I'm a professor of business, so to speak. This is what they're trying to tell us and that they're better than all of us, which would make you feel like shit. Right. Then you start saying, well, what's wrong with you, you pussy? Uh, why can't you operate on Mark on uh, four or five hours sleep a night for, for the last 20 years? Well, because no one does, I don't think. I think it's all bullshit. Yeah, I, I really think it is. And it catches up with you sooner or later. Yeah, yeah. And there's literally pictures of me from 10 years ago. People see it. They go, oh, my God, you look so old there. I look younger today, 10 years later. And I do believe it's... One, stress management, but two, I'm getting, I'm getting better and longer sleep. Wow. And how does nutrition fit into all these things? Like, uh, so you, you did talk about, um, you know, the three things you yeah. want to have in terms of protein, fats, and um, carbs. carbs. Um, and that was pretty precision-based. In other words, you, you have a, a formula around it. Yeah. But we keep getting told that, you know, the so-called Mediterranean diet is the best diet in the world, et cetera. Um, how do you actually formulate what you actually put in front of yourself or what your family has for that matter. I mean, because, you know, your kids, your kids are little. So, like, um, you know, do you ever sit around and enjoy what your kids are enjoying or do you try to get the whole family into one regime? We, my wife and I brainwashed our kids early on. Today, like I said, Andrew is 18, Chloe is 16. They have yet to be inside of a McDonald's. They've never seen the inside of a McDonald's. They've never seen a McDonald's or any fast food restaurant commercial on television. Wow. Because we never had regular television. I realized I was brainwashed by television. I would watch Knight Rider and A-Team, and then I would see commercials, and I would eat Frosted Flakes and sugar-laden cereal. And so I realized television is a source of influence. And so if I can control the influence that my kids are seeing and I can build a pattern of working out today, so I started taking Andrew and Chloe to the gym when they were five, six years old. And today when I'm traveling, my son will text me, dad, what's a good back workout? What's a good leg workout I could do? They're addicted. Just like I came here today and thank you for um, introducing me to uh, Larry, um, right? Jiu Jitsu, like I can't break my routine just because I'm traveling. And so I still eat the same way I, I still train this. I have to get my two sessions a week of jujitsu in because I'm so new to it 
that I will forget. I will forget. I, just just talk about that for a minute. How easy is it as we get older? Oh man, to forget what oh, they man. what they showed you. What do they say? They say youth is wasted on the young. My God, like like they get you in a position and they you know you're supposed to do something, but you can't remember. I can't remember. And man. I could learn it last week. I could literally learn it last yeah. week. And if they teach me too many things in one session, uh, I, I'm just saying, just do it. Keep it simple. Give, just give me two things. Oh, my week. God. And I lay in bed the, the next before I go the next time <laughs> and I'm think, thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I haven't thought about this since last my last session. What did he say? Where's my leg go? Where's my arm go? It seems That's a bit exactly. crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I think Larry, he's so knowledgeable. He, he, he knows more than I'll ever acquire. And um, – I think he wanted to impress us with how much he, I said, Larry, just show us two things. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and he showed us two things. And I said, I'd rather just drill this for the rest of the 90 minutes yeah. that we have with you and then roll after that, then learn four or five things, then I'll mix them all up and know nothing. Uh, but jujitsu, it is a human chess game. And I'll find myself doing step one and two, and then I'll pause and I'm thinking, and I could see my opponent looking down at me, like seeing the wheels spin. I, if there was any one thing I wish I would have started sooner in life, they jujitsu. It would be jujitsu. It's funny, though, like, because there's something about it. Um, it's not. It's not really fighting. It's sort of it's a combination of different things. But it's quite of a brain game. Um, it is. And getting your body to do the thing that your brain wants it to do. Yeah. And I, I find it quite cognitively um, important because someone gets you, especially you know when you're one of the worst in the class and definitely the oldest. Um, someone gets you in a, in a position, um, you got to think, well, what, I know how to get – I've got out of this before. I, I know what I've got to do, but then you've got to make your body do it. Right. And it's a bit weird. Uh, your body's not going to do it. Right. As we get old. When you're, when you're 20, you you wouldn't be able to do it. No worries. Oh, you, you can get an arm bar somewhere because you throw your legs up and grab. But, like, I, I, I know what to do a lot of times, but I just my body just won't do it. And I think that's a really important thing as we get older to um, – for our mobility – and I think it's why people fall over as they get older. I agree. They know that they should be negotiating a certain thing in a certain way when they're walking somewhere, maybe with a bag or they could be carrying a, a grandkid or whatever the case may be, but they just can't do the thing that they should do. It, it, that's the reason I do it Yeah. At, at, the, at my age now. That's exactly it. And I, and I realize that I'm not going to stretch and do mobility, but if I do jujitsu, yeah. it forces me to stretch, do mobility, and as you said, cognitively, it connects my mind and body together in a way that, I don't think there's anything else out there that I'd be interested in doing that would connect my mind and body together that way. It, it's funny the stretch thing. You're right. It's not a thing that I. It forces doing. you to stretch, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't really dig it that much. Right. I, I mean, like I, I, I did do yoga for a little while, uh, mainly because my part of the time she was a yoga teacher. But it's not something that really gets me. Right. Uh, I don't want to be. And you know, this sounds a bit sexist, but I, I don't really want to be in a class with a whole lot of girls, and I'm the only dude in there. I feel a bit weird. Um, I think yoga is great, but it's just I just don't feel comfortable doing it. I'd rather just roll around the joint, like you, like we're saying in jujitsu, and get put into weird positions and have to move my body around. And and I think that you know people listening to this, um, these are new things. Like jujitsu is relatively speaking new things. I mean Dana White, what he's done is is brilliant. Like oh. by introducing UFC to yeah. the world, and all of us now seeing jujitsu, we would never have seen it unless we went to the Olympics and watched the judo or the wrestling or something. But all of a sudden, these are new things that have been put in front of us, and they're very accessible. I don't know about your country, but in this country, my God, there are so many jujitsu gyms in this country. They're everywhere. Yeah. Like, uh, and it's crazy for us not to access these things for the benefits we get out of it, and make it part of our routine, which makes it part of our structure, which helps our mindset, which helps us um, get through the day and through the year, and hopefully successfully. Yeah. Can we just talk about your tour? Yes. Your tour here in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So what, what's the content? What are you, what are you talking to everyone about? Uh, and so it's by Fizz Productions, and the event is called Rise to Greatness and takes place in Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. Can I just say Brisbane? Brisbane, I apologize. So if, uh, no, they spell Brisbane. Okay. But if you're out in uh, Brisbane, people just get Brisbane. Uh, where was he? Was that Brisbane? Brisbane, got it. Uh, thank, got thank you it. for the correction. Brisbane, Melbourne, and Australia, and uh, and Sydney, and rise to greatness. Not only great speakers, but it's about empowering people to rise to their higher potential, to become the best version of yourself. We all know, we all have a conscience that speaks to us when we're if you're up later than you should be. 
there's that conversation in the back of your head, like, hey, you should be asleep right now. If you're eating something you shouldn't be eating, there's that conversation in the back of your head. I call it the secondary conversation that takes place. That's your conscience. That's this, your creator speaking to you. And what do we do? We ignore it and we just turn up the volume on the television or we take another shot or we eat another slice of cake, whatever. But if you listen to your conscience, it wants to, it wants you to rise to your greatness, to your highest level of greatness. Think what you've done. You have developed to your highest version of yourself, then gave yourself to the world through television, media, et cetera, this podcast and everything. If, if Mark did not take the time to develop his highest level of himself, then, then you would not have the opportunities to serve humanity and to do things for yourself and your family. And so Rise to Greatness is just an amazing event that uh, I think will be transformational for everyone who attends. And I think every year that Rob and his wife put this event on, uh, more people should attend if they're looking to break out of the rat race and win their financial freedom, their mental freedom, and realize there's a better path to life than just being a cog in the wheel. How long are you up on the stage for? And is it your interview or you're, you're doing a presentation? I'm doing a presentation. Yeah, yep. I'm doing a presentation and uh, we'll be here eight days in total. And But you're on stage during any one presentation? Oh, um, two presentations. I believe there's a Q&A, question and answer session, and a 90-minute uh, presentation, like, presentation a, like a talk. Well. Exactly. And then, and are you hitting on things like um, mindset, mindset strategies, um, you know, routines, important instruction, all that yeah. sort of stuff? Specifically how to make more money, how to find your source of purpose, meaning, right? Money, meaning, self-mastery. How to make more money, how to find your sen- source of meaning in life. Because let's face it, we all need a sense of meaning. If you don't have a sense of meaning, you feel like you don't belong. You start feeling having dark thoughts soon after. But if you have a sense of meaning, like you belong, there's a purpose that you're put on this planet for, you will push through whatever is necessary. So more money, more meaning, and more self-mastery. Become the higher version of yourself. Drop your ego, connect to higher self, solve through your trauma, heal, uh, stop reacting to things, and instead respond to things like, like an adult. Like we see great giant adults having temper tantrums emotionally because they are emotionally retarded. And we need to, I should get canceled for that, I'm sure. <laughs> so I'll say it again. They get emotionally retarded instead of being emotionally aware. And when you're emotionally aware, you can go, okay, am I about to react to what Mark said? Does Mark have any bad intentions towards me? Or maybe Mark's having a bad day and I should say, hey, friend, are you okay? Right? But depending on where my emotional state is, I may react instead of respond and trying to help a friend. Maybe you're just having a bad day and you took it out on me because I'm safe. The person that has elevated to higher self can tell the difference. The person who hasn't now becomes inflammatory. So in ter- just in terms of, because I mean, perhaps you and I are lucky we've, we live this life, but to some people when you say sort of discover or, or find out what your purpose is, but what, what does that mean to, to people who might be listening to this? Because, you know, am I meant to be a butcher and serve my community where I live, where I at my butcher shop, I want to serve my community with the best quality meat possible. But what is the purpose? Of your how do you find out what your purpose is? Good, what are the- good question. It's actually well, I'll have two purposes. I'll start there. Your first purpose is really, and people will ask it this way: they'll say, "What is the meaning of life, Bedros?" And I'll say, "Easy, <laughs> easy. You don't have to worry about the meaning of life. Ask what is the meaning of my life." So you are your first purpose. And I believe, again, whether you believe in God or the universe or universal consciousness, doesn't matter to me. Whatever, whoever our creator is, made us this way with where we will experience trauma, adversity. Uh, you didn't come with an owner's manual. Did your mom and dad give you an <laughs> owner's manual? No, nor did mine. Yet I can go buy a microwave or a refrigerator. It comes with an owner's manual. Yeah, exactly. Yet something this complex with emotions and thoughts and feelings and, and movement, I have no owner's manual. And I believe God or our creator wants us to figure out what is the meaning of my life. Relative to everybody else? Yes. Yeah. See, when we try and understand the meaning of life, that's overwhelming. What is the meaning of my life? Well, how about the meaning of my life is to first be a good father. Be a good husband. What does that look like? Raise kids who are going to be an asset to humanity and not a liability. Uh, have a wife who feels like she's heard and understood and a partner in what I do. Okay, great. Manage, have patience, manage my anger, heal through the traumas that I've experienced. Like I said, I've experienced sexual trauma, physical trauma, physical abuse. That doesn't make me a victim, but I, those 
things that happened to me as a young man will show up in my life in a negative way if I don't heal through it. So the meaning of my life is first to heal through my traumas and the adversities that I faced and to raise a family that is going to be an asset and not a liability to humanity. And it is to be myself to be a, an asset and not a liability on my fellow man. And then from there, I'm now at a place, uh, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now I'm at a place where I can go, all right, now, now that I've healed, I've got a family who is sovereign and free and free thinking. How else can I serve humanity? Well, for me, it's fitness. When people ask me, how can I get out of my depression? I said, do you have abs? No, I don't. Get your abs. What do you mean? Yeah, if you get your abs, you will fall madly in love with yourself. In the process of getting your abs, eating right and working out hard, you will suffer so much, but you'll have to keep going to the gym to burn the fat and build the muscle. And when you do, you will release dopamine, serotonin, and it will help you escape your depression and anxiety. When you do, and you get to the best version of yourself and you start solving all your problems, you know this when you're working out, how many times are you on there rolling and someone's about to get you in a rear naked chokehold or a guillotine chokehold and you're thinking through a work problem. Like some of my best problem solving happens when I'm about to get choked out or arm barred or something because I also realize like I'm suffering and I do believe suffering introduces a man to his highest self. And the world has gotten so soft, so complacent that we try and stay away from any kind of suffering and we've become fragile. We need to become anti-fragile. So to me, our second source of purpose is once you've healed through your shit, once you are a good friend, a good husband, a good father, a good business partner, what is my source of serving humanity? For me, it's through fitness, right? I always tell people, if you can get fit physically, you will get fit mentally and emotionally. Now, someone else might say, I'm going to be a butcher and I'm going to feed you good food. And that good food is going to nourish your body and you're going to feel good about yourself. You're going to go out there and do good. I don't know what someone else's source of purpose is, but I do know mine. And I got to this, I knew what my source of purpose is because at first I took time to heal myself and work on my first source of meaning, the meaning of my life, which is to develop, to basically develop my own owner's manual. That morning routine you talked about, the evening routine that you have, the structure, the discipline, you have written Mark's owner's manual. I've written my own. And everyone needs to write their own owner's manual first and then go out and serve the world with that. How important is honesty to yourself when you are sitting down? You said get your shit together, like yeah. and work out the things that are sort of making you feel bad. And, yeah. and, you know, like in your case, you've suffered some traumas in your life. How important is it to be honest and to confront those things? And do you need somebody else to help you through that process? Is it important? Some people just can't do I think just can't do it on their own. Yeah, I think most people can't do it on their own. You know, what do they say? They say, what got you here won't get you there, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you have to be brutally honest with yourself. And I think most people overestimate how awesome they are, how amazing they are, uh, and they underestimate how, how little problems they have until it's too late. You know, people who have their ear, earbuds in and they're walking through a city at night, they overestimate how safe they are. The former me, the 1.0 version of me, the young man who was very angry. I used to carjack. I used to do home invasion robberies. And I today, I could see someone walking with earbuds in at night. I could see where their purse is. If it's on the street side, it's gonna, they're going to be easier to snatch. I'm a 49-year-old successful man. I have no intention of robbing someone. But my predatory instincts still make me look. And when I see that, I go, they overestimate how safe they are. And they underestimate how deadly I can be, or another bad guy can be. And I think if you can be brutally honest, you realize most people are sitting ducks. Like several years ago, we were, my family and I were flying back from my, uh, Maui, and uh, my son and I were sitting over here in first class. My wife and my daughter were sitting here in first class across the aisle, uh, but we were the last row of first class. Up front and to the left, in the uh, second row of first class, there's a gentleman hitting the back of the seat, making the gun gesture. Now it's 11 o'clock at night, man. We're flying over the Pacific Ocean. And I had just started training in MMA. I hadn't learned jujitsu yet, but in MMA, you know this, you learn guillotine and rear naked choke holds and arm bars and things like that. And all of a sudden I see the flight attendants, they're lacing together two zip cuffs and they're coming down the aisle and I stopped him and I said, ma'am, is everything okay? Like, is that, what's going on? She goes, he's a flight risk. I said, well, can I help? She said, well, by law, we have to ask him to put these on. And I look at him and he's going berserk, Mark. He's lost his shit. And I go, that man is going to put on those zip cuffs? He goes, we hope so. 
Okay. So they get in front of him and you can see the lady, uh, hey, you know, you have to put this on. He stands up and starts screaming. She looks at me and I look at the guy sitting behind my wife and we had both made this eye contact. Like if shit goes down, we're going to help. I really thought this is post 9-11 that I thought my biggest concern is I'm going to be the first one there. I'm going to be stuck under a pile of humans. I'm going to suffocate. That was my biggest concern. Like, oh shit. Right. Little did I know that it was just going to be me and that guy and no one else. Everyone else had their phones out filming. <laughs> and so I, I ran over, got him in a rear naked chokehold, then had to get him in a guillotine chokehold so we can put his arms behind his back and lace him up. The whole time I'm panicking, I'm sweating. God has gifted me with two things, a lot of body hair and a lot of sweat glands. I was sweating profusely and coming back from, from Hawaii, I was wearing flip flops. And so I'm sliding out of my flip flops. So now whenever I'm on a plane, I lace up my shoes really tight because if I have to choke a motherfucker out again, I'm never going to slip out of my flip flops. And he was a tall guy. So I, I didn't know how to take him down. I just hugged his neck and didn't let go until he collapsed and then got into a guillotine chokehold. But I share this with you because it doesn't matter where I'm traveling to. Like I want to, as old as I get, I want to be an asset to humanity. Like God forbid if I'm on another plane and something goes down, I don't want to be there hoping that someone jumps and saves the day. I want to be the one to save the day. In fact, jokingly, I told my son as we were coming to Australia, he's 18 and muscular and he boxes and he does jujitsu. I said, son, if shit goes down, I'm delegating it to you. Only if it gets bad, I'm going to get up and help. You know, and he laughed about it. He goes, don't worry, dad, I got is you. Is he fit? He is. He is. He's Unlike a, yourself. At, <laughs> unlike yeah. yourself at 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fit. He's unlike fit. myself at 18, he's fit. He weighs 175 pounds. Uh, lean, muscular, boxes, does jujitsu, um, plays a good, just, he's, I'm in awe of my kids, man. I'm in awe of my kids. They're well, just, they say the apple doesn't drop far from the tree. Yeah, well, I mean, like, you. I mean, that's got to be a lot to do with yourself and your, your wife. Thank you. And thank you. the mother. And, uh, and I guess, uh, your, by the way, um, your dad is yeah. still alive. My dad is alive. My mom died, um, about 10 months ago. Yeah. Not so long ago. Yeah. And so, and when you sit down with your dad, cause this is sort of where we started, when you sit down with your dad and you, know, you talk about, he's no doubt very proud of what he has done and his family has done. Do you ever sort of sit down together and reflect on, you know, going to Rome, you know, from Armenia, um, and then off to America and where you all landed, where you are today? Do you ever sit down and reflect on that? We do. We did. He's ninety one now. Uh, we did more of that when he in the seventies and eighties. Uh, today at 91, his memory is not as sharp as it used to be. Yeah. Um, but I'm so glad that I was smart enough to ask questions like, Dad, what made you want to escape? And he said, oh, you don't remember when I wore Jordache jeans and Ray-Ban sunglasses and listened to the Beach Boys in, in Armenia? I said, no, I don't remember that. He goes, oh, I was born an American just in the wrong country. Holy shit. So he goes, yeah, I just I was in the wrong country and I needed to escape and bring you guys with me. Like he came to America because... He felt we'd have a better opportunity, but he felt that he was born in the wrong country. Like, what a visionary, you know? And so the stories that he tells me, he, tell, he told me a story um, actually recently, uh, maybe a couple months ago. I said, Dad, I think you helped one of your friends stop smoking. So he used to be a hunter. They would hunt rabbit and squirrel and foxes, small game in Armenia. I said, can you tell me, because my son Andrew was with me, I said, can you tell me and Andrew how you stopped one of your friends from smoking cigarettes? Oh, he goes, easy, easy. And he tells Andrew, he goes, Andrew, Andrew, you listen to me. You listen to me. And so his friend which was a chain smoker in Armenia. My dad goes and buys a pack of cigarettes, <clears throat> takes one of the cigarettes, takes half of the tobacco out, takes a bullet, takes a little bit of the gunpowder out, puts it in the cigarette, puts the tobacco back in, tells his friend, hey, you want a cigarette? And he pulls out the right one. And gives it to his friend. Of course, the friend lights it up and the thing blows up in his face and immediately he stops smoking. And he goes, you have to be bold, son. I did bold things to help my friends. And he said, I did bold things to make sure that you guys have the life that you want. Like he was a visionary. Like he did things. He risked his life and he he has a sweet tongue. In Armenian, we say a uh, lezu, a sweet tongue, where he was able to finagle his way through the American consult in Rome and when we got here, he found a way to get people to help us and like us and not see us as a threat. Uh, and I learned so much of that. So yeah, we do get together, um, especially earlier on, and we talk about like, like, look where we've gotten. You know, the fact that my sister works for me full time and does nothing. That was one of my life goals, <laughs> right? One of my life goals. She's was, listening. Yeah. You heard it. Yeah. If, if you don't agree with him, tell me. When you say he does, she, he's just said you do nothing. 
literally nothing. And I love that. And I want that for her. And that's because when we came to Armenia, uh, to America, she had a job, one of the three jobs that she had, she was a waitress at a pizzeria, the same pizzeria that my dad was a busboy. And the owner of that pizzeria was very suggestive, was very handsy, gropey with her. And she would cry to my dad, like, I don't want to work here anymore. He said, one more month, just need the money, one more month. And, you know, remember, she's 16 years older than me. So she's also like a second mom to me. And I remember going to her feeling helpless. And I said, hey, sis, when I'm rich, when I'm older, I'm going to be so rich, you'll never have to work again. So 14 years ago, um, I told her to quit her company job that she had. And she works for me doing nothing. And I love that. And my dad is so grateful to me. Till this day, he says, I know what you're doing for your sister and your brother. Thank you for that. And I'm like, dude, it's no worries. It's the least I could do. It, 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 I, I got once told by a, an Armenian friend of mine who passed away, but he, an Armenian friend of mine, he told me that, Mark, he said, Armenians are the best traders in the world, the best merchants in the world. And I said, why? He said, because <clears throat> we sit between Europe, or we used to sit historically between Europe and the Middle East, and of course, China, uh, in terms of the Silk Road. He said, so everything had to go through Armenia and had to get traded one way or the other. He said, Armenians sort of grew up with this, um, yeah, over the centuries, grew up with this sort of history of being able to do deals and and build bridges between organisations, but you know, actually, cre- sort of broker things to happen and build bridges between people and concepts, people and products, people and services. And it seems to me that um, Bedros is that what you're doing is that you're you're in your in your job today in your business today, you sort of build a bridge between consumers, your audience, consumers of what you talk about, your audience build a bridge between them and what can be possibly with the best version of themselves. So that's a quite an important, by the way, a big responsibility. It is. A huge responsibility, yeah. which you've adopted. Yeah. You know, that bridge is for some people, in particular for some people, could be make or break it for them. Yeah. You know, because you're to some extent, you're there's potentially their salvation and they look up to you for that and they will come along and listen to you and pay money to listen to you for that. Do you feel a level of responsibility in that regard to make sure that they go away with something? I mean, how big is that responsibility on your shoulders? There's a massive responsibility where that's concerned. <clears throat> I, um, I'm, I'm organically, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I'm an INTJ, introverted, intuitive, thinker, judicial, very high introvert. And I think, and I, people ask me, is there a God? And I go, of course there's a God. He made me a high introvert and then told me my purpose is to do what extroverts do, get in front of a microphone, get on stage and speak to tens of thousands of millions of people. I, 15 years of speaking, I still sweat profusely. I'm always nervous when I'm on stage. Once I'm on stage, a sense of comfort comes over me. And I believe, I say, you know, the universe or God speaks through me. Source just speaks through me. I'm just a megaphone. When that happens, I almost go out of body sometimes. It's, it's fascinating. But the pressure that I feel as an introvert, uh, when I'm still stopped on the streets, I don't know how, oh, you're Bedros Kuli and I follow you. I didn't know what to say before. My wife taught me three things. Hey, what's your name? What do you do? What is your favorite part of my show? Because I don't know what to ask. They're my three questions. Are those your three exactly questions? Exactly the same thing. Oh, okay. Are you an introvert by chance? Yeah. Okay. There you go. There you go. Because I connect one-on-one like this really well. I could do this all day long. Put me on stage. My armpits are sweating. My back's sweating. Put, you know. And so while I'm grateful for the opportunities, the responsibility that I have, and I think I magnify that to myself. I make it bigger than it should be. But it's also why I, my give a shit factor, as my wife says, is so high. I give a shit uh, to the point where I'll... I was telling everybody at dinner last night, I say, watch, tomorrow before I get on stage, I'm going to have to pee and pee again and pee again. My, my bladder goes out of control. I feel like I'm getting a sore throat. I'm running a fever. And as soon as I'm, I'm on stage, Mark, I'm 100% fine. relaxed. Man, it's fucking nuts. 15 right. years later. Yeah. But that's introvert living in an extrovert life. Yeah. So basically, to some extent, it's a performance of the content. Yeah. You, you perform. You, you switch on. Yeah. The moment you get on the stage. Yeah. And yeah. you perform with your content, yeah. And uh, you deliver on your promise. I, I think I do. I have yet to hear anyone ask for a refund, and it's been fifteen years. Bedros Kulin has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much.